Welcome to the December gathering of the Dorman Williams Public Library Recite Poetry Group. It's a mouthful, but this month we are happily celebrating the Poetry Society of Vermont as they mark their 75th anniversary. Now, Recite, for those of you who haven't been here before, um, is an, a monthly open mic poetry gathering that first met about seven years ago and has evolved over the years, kept meeting pretty much during the pandemic via Zoom only, and now we're back to the hybrid. And I want to say something about the hybrid. We are, um, we are recording this, and um, we're lucky to have WCTV, the Woodstock uh, Community Access Channel, filming it, and it will be available after this evening. Um, we will try and make sure we include everybody both on the screen and in the room. This is the biggest event I've done with the OWL so far. So I um, want to mention, for those of you who are zooming in and also here, the OWL tracks sound. So if somebody is reading a poem and somebody's shuffling papers or coughing really loud, the camera's going to go to that person. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, and other than that, the format's going to be pretty straightforward. Following open remarks about the PSOV, the Poetry Society of Vermont, um, the trustee, George Longenecker, is going to speak briefly. And then we'll just go around the room, online and in person, and take turns reciting or reading a selected poem. It can be one you wrote or one by somebody else. And um, because we're a larger group than usual, we're going to ask that you either stand up or come to the podium to read so people can hear you. Um, we're going to ask you to tell us your name and where you're zooming in from or driving in from and uh, keep the intro to the poem uh, pretty brief, somewhat brief. And there may be time to go around for a second time, maybe a third time, depending on, on how it all goes. And then at the end, local writer and um, Poetry Society of Vermont member, Geza, I'm going to do this right. <laughs> to trial day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that good? Um, he'll bring the uh, evening to the close at around 7. So without further ado, George. Thank you, Liza. Thanks to the Williams Library and to Recite for having us. So I'm, I'm the executive secretary and past president of the Poetry Society of Vermont. We have been around since 1947. The group is almost as old as I am. And we put out this journal, The Mountain Troubadour. It's been coming out since 1956. Started as more of a newsletter, now it's a literary journal. Here was our pandemic issue. I have a couple of the 2020 issues to give away if you'd like one. Also, please sign in if you're interested in joining the Poetry Society of Vermont. Give me your email address, and this would be a good time to inquire and get more information because I'm sending out the call for poems for the next Mountain Troubadour on Thursday. Thanks again. Thank you. Anyways, just two very short poems. One, since it's the Poetry Society of Vermont, um, it's about how my poems come to be. So here it is. My poems grow like a tree. My poems grow like a tree. Ideas germinate in the mind's fertile soil. Tonal words with meaning emerge and, like fresh shoots, sprout into rhythmic lines. New thoughts, new directions spread their roots, their tendrils. Lo, a metaphor forms, a freshly budding, budding bough. And an image blossoms like a fragrant flower. Alliterations buzz like summer bumblebees. In my ecstatic ear, a perfected picture with transcendent music, painted with few words. So the, the next one is a poem which is appropriate for the season as we're approaching Christmas. And I wrote this uh, for Christmas uh, 2020. Can you speak up just yes. a little? Christmas Eve 2020, it's called. Christmas Eve 2020 is finally here. 
I just settle my brain for a long winter's nap. And alone I wait with great anticipation for the joyful sound of hoofs pawing on the roof, the dancing and prancing of eight tiny reindeer. Will our old Saint Nick come down the chimney this year to bring the presents, uh, presents I asked for in my letter? Or instead of biting on the stump of his pipe, is our dear chubby and plump red jolly old elf our immunocompromised obese Santa Claus, now sucking oxygen from the ventilator in the ICU of some overrun hospital somewhere near the North Pole, cared for by his elves, all infected by the dreaded COVID virus. Will he survive to perform his act next Christmas? Um, for some reason this evening, I thought of a poem that people have liked. Um, that's uh, a narrative poem about a childhood event that's uh, in my first collection and it's called Pyrenees. Pyrenees. Had we just sung a song together, one of our car songs, Old MacDonald or Daisy Daisy? Or had we just been gazing in silence out the car windows, awed by the Pyrenean range? Certainly my father was exhilarated by the climb, as competent on the hairpin bends, up and up, gravel spinning, the setting sun glinting on his horn-rimmed glasses. The back seat was my domain along with the picnic basket and the extra cardigans. My mother navigated from the front left seat, competent and serene. We stopped for a moment by the marker at the highest point, elevation 1000 meters, named in Spanish. Dusk coming, no one seen for miles. My father kept his engine running I remember us all smiling on top of the world. We had just begun the steep descent when from out behind the crags they came, eight of them at least, and they had guns. Their hair was wild, their eyes were wild. They had a fierce intent. From both sides of the road they came, leaping down at our car, no room to speed away no chance for quick escape. My father halted the car. He gripped the steering wheel and stared straight ahead. My mother stiffened ramrod in her seat, whimpering squeakily. Behind them, as if in a dream, my eyes locked wide and time stood still. Perhaps it was their leader who tapped on dad's window with his rifle. The others stood back, eyes piercing our windows through the dusk. The car seemed a cocoon that would shatter at any moment. The leader tapped on the window once again. I remember my father's calm. I remember his careful, rapid consideration that moment, that silence, all but for that tap, tap on the window and the trilling of a bird high in the graying sky. Carefully, slowly, dad wound the window down, his knuckles white, his breathing carefully slow. He brought the window down an inch or two and turned towards that fierce face so close to his outside the glass. The bandit lowered his rifle, reached to his breast pocket. All three of us inside held our breaths. Would this be the end? Was it only a moment ago we were singing? From his jacket pocket, the man's hand, worn and pitted, brought out an envelope, a letter. The script was spidery and fine. On the corner was a Spanish stamp. Postali, he panted through the small gap in the window. Postali, Postali, he signed with his hands and his eyes turned from fierce to pleading. My father carefully took the letter, 
carefully nodded his head, nodded over and over, looked the man directly in the eye. Post Starley, he whispered, placing the envelope in his own breast pocket. Then slowly, he wound up the window, put the car into gear and carefully drew away. All our eyes peered warily at the rear view mirror, none of us daring to turn to see for real the bandits lined up behind us in the road. In the mirror, we saw their leader salute us with a wave. Was it 50 kilometers or 10, we rolled through the hairpins, down, down into the town. Nothing broke our silence until dad saw the letterbox and shoved that letter in. Then we all broke into laughter and dad broke into song. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer, do. Thank you. <laughs> I just was reminded by an email from, what's the Academy of Poets, whatever, former day people, that December, one of the birthday poets, or poet birthday, is Raina Maria Rilke. So I just, this is the, one of the most recent poems I've been memorizing, called The Panther. <clears throat> From endless passing of the bars, his gaze has wearied, and there is no more it can hold. There seem to be a thousand bars always, and beyond those thousand bars, there is no world. The soft pad of his brawny, rippling pace turns itself in a tightening circle till, like a mighty dance around a tiny space, it centers a numb but still enormous will. But at times, the shades of his pupils rise, grasping an image it cannot resist. Through his unmoving limbs it flies, and within his heart it ceases to exist. <sighs> okay, so this is a poem that I wrote some time ago, actually. The title is Moving from the Old House. Dishes, lamp, grandfather's clock. What has been mine, you may take with you. All that I will need, you gave to me long ago. Here, as always on the shelf, a cheap white china vase. Chipped, it fits a child's hand. Daisies, plucked leaves and roots together from my garden. All by myself, you ran to me. Do you like my bouquet? It's for you. Your hand in mine, petals soft against my skin and fragrant. How small your hand was, how greatly you believed in me. Upstairs, near my lipsticks and mirror, a photo postcard. Love from Shacoma Beach, Mascoma Lake. In one hand, your red bucket with its blue shovel, while the other pulls up again that disobedient strap of your first two-piece but not a bikini suit. Nine-year-old legs stick thin above those bright jellies, those sandals I can't live without, neon pink with platforms much too high, said I, your smile big, still girlishly bold. Abandoned on the sand lit lies some favorite bear whose name I know I'll not remember again. Against my kitchen door still stands this wooden witch, its faded paint beginning to flake. At summer camp in Meredith, you carved and sanded, dutifully sanded and carved, wrote letters filled with sighs and giggles, names of boys who, rainy nights watching old movies in the rec hall, held your hand, one who kissed you. I've boxed your drawings, letters, poems, 
labeled cartons, your name, the dates. You've packed your car with things you love, taking what it seems you need or value. I'll watch you pull away from what's been home, but ready now myself, the movers come tomorrow. I may be sad, but I'm glad to travel light. Fragile memory owns your sticky kisses, those secret smiles, that one last wave goodbye. So with all this poetry stuff, you need a little patience. We must learn to ignore the swollen words to search through these screaming exercises patiently, to see beneath the sophisticated symbols delicately disguising the true nature of things, cloaking the poet's inevitable failure in some dazzling display of mind. <laughs> Sorry, it's great. I love it. Go ahead. We must learn to look for the spaces, Yash. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> to hear the naked melody quiver beneath the conceited contrivance and betray an urgent, mournful song of unspeakable sensations. The divine human comedy and tragedy, circus clowns crying for reality, the being before the born. Lord, what fools us mortals be. So I just came to see what's happening in Vermont. Uh, my, uh, my poet friend, uh, Geza, Geza Tatroliai, uh, told me about this or invited me to come to it, but uh, I see he's not here. At least I don't see yeah. him. Oh, he's here. Okay, hi. Hi, Geza. He read before you signed on. Okay, any case, I've got this uh, book, um, this new book called Rainbow Weather, and I'll read a few things from it, or I'll read one thing from it right now. Um, this is called uh, uh, The Lake of Our Emergence. What is a word, a meaningful vibration? In the beginning was the word, and the word, was creation, rock, air, fire, water, oak leaves, ocean waves, tropical jungles, oscillates, gasps of ecstasy, groans of love. We look into each other's eyes as we pass in the street. We don't say a word, but we understand the meaningful vibrations beyond words or before words, both before and beyond words at the same time. All living things, all non-living things, music, waterfalls on this planet and beyond, flocks of small birds in the early morning, crickets at dusk, the gurgle of a baby, the voices in a singing brook, what are words? Meaningful vibrations. In the beginning was the word, and the word was creation. We walk these slippery banks along the lake of our emergence, the center pole of our forest, our muddy port of entry into this world, our origin of place, our place of origin. We step from the lake into the place we belong. Only briefly do we walk here today, learning how to be indigenous. These restless streets we pace, where our unborn great-grandchildren play. Breezes blow wavelets rolling toward the far shore, while around us, hushed fields of poppies grow, and beneath, their, beneath our feet, rocks melt and caverns of magma flow. The uniforms, face shields, nightsticks separating brother from daughter, 
sister from mother, do not separate illusion from delusion. All truth is recreated each morning when a small bird peeks out of a nest hidden in a lilac bush by the water's edge. To be able to walk here since the world began is a gift of inexpressible joy. Who gets to claim this wild watery homeland as their own? Who gets to call it home? Every place is the center of the world and everywhere is our place of origin. So what I would like to do is a quick poem in honor of the Vermont Poetry Society. And then I have two sonnets. So I don't know if that, does that work? How do you want me to do it? I'll do the first one first. The first one and then okay. one. Yeah, the other two have to go together. Okay, otherwise so let's sense. do one and let everybody speak and then you can do the other. All right, great. So poetry doesn't have many rewards. <laughs> and yet we can be very much within the presence of great, great poets as we cherish their words because their presence remains in their lines. So that said, with Rilke, you keep at, in Songs of Orpheus, he says, the world keeps changing quickly as cloud shapes. All things perfected fall home to the age old. Over the changing and passing, wider and freer, still lasts your leading song, God with the lyre. Sufferings have not been understood, neither has love been learned, and what removes us in death is left unveiled. Only song <laughs> over the land hallows and celebrates. Thanks. I'll read two of mine from the current issue of the Mountain Troubadour. This one's uh, we can plan it this way, but it's a follow up to the poem case I read. <laughs> Many ordinary things continued despite a pandemic, continued despite war, drought, and fire. Somewhere a boy got up to urinate. Somewhere a man changed the baby's diapers. Somewhere else a child cried. Her mother awakened slowly and went to the crib. In the morning, while it was still dark, someone turned on lights, cooked eggs, made coffee. Someone wept over a death, a white sheet placed over someone's face. Somewhere else, it was dark. Curtains were drawn, lamps lit like every night. Somewhere after dog, after dark, a dog barked and barked. Is that your poem? That's mine. Yeah. And this is mine too. Hearts and Hummingbirds. Someone taped Red Valentine's hearts on storefront windows, stone pillars, church doors, so many hearts. Hummingbirds' hearts beat 1,250 times a minute. They dive at 60 miles per hour. In sixth grade, we gave each other Valentine's heart cards and chocolate hearts. Bobby Griffin didn't open his. Scott stuffed them in his desk. Hummingbirds hover over a red awning, dive toward bee ball and iris. On Valentine's Day, she gave me books of poetry, Blue Hour and Wild Iris. They feed on flowers with long forked tongues, hover and then dip into bleeding hearts and lilies. Bleeding heart, a person who shows exaggerated sympathy. 
But what's wrong with giving all your heart? A hummingbird's heart functions just like mine. Similar ventricles, chambers, and arteries. All those songs about hearts and those chocolate hearts. Even vegetarians eat them. Hummingbirds live on sugar, eat half their weight daily, fiercely defend their flowers. Another year she gave me rising, falling, hovering, and pity the beautiful. They've migrated now, 500 miles or more. No hummingbirds hovering over red paper hearts in February. One day a ruby-throated hummingbird hovered over iris and my glass of red wine. My heart beat faster. Uh, little poem to celebrate winter in Vermont. And we've just had our first major snowfall, so it's about, uh, about snowflakes. It's called Christine Snowflakes. Christine snowflakes float from the gray sky, blanketing the world in nuptial white. Bedecked in my sorrows, I step outside and violate this virginal landscape, crushing crystals, churning up dirt and ashes, and so on, turning the frozen natural order of the microcosm where my roots alight into liquefying, I can't see this, heaving anarchy. The, the, the big question as my boots crunch along, Will the next snowfall restore this beauty? And another little poem, but this is just a haiku. Uh, and uh, uh, I know ha haiku are not supposed to have uh, titles, but I call them, I give, give, give my haiku titles because I put them in volumes of poetry. So it's frosty night. The night is frosty. I wake to snow on the ground. Spring is far away. <laughs> um, thinking of Geza's Vermont poem makes me want to read a Vermont poem, but a very different mood. This is, uh, you know, as a Brit, pardon me if I don't get Vermont right, but I've been here long enough, I give it a go. So here comes Ina's Vermont poem, and it's called Perhaps It Was the Pie. Oh, yeah. Perhaps it was the pie that did it, but then it could have been the hot dogs. Here at our place, you'd never know the difference. What it definitely was, regardless, was the homebrew Uncle Reggie brought. Big glass cowboys with red rubber stoppers lined up against the kitchen wall. That's what Uncle Reggie always did revving us up every year. Every year he came to the farm for our famous family parties. Parties written up in columns in the Randolph Herald, the Vermont Standard, even the Valley News. Miss Pris from over on the North Road wrote her column really mean, trying to embarrass us, we said. But the best news was the stuff that Betty wrote full of dirt and giggles, on and on about how her 76-year-old sister wet her pants laughing when the pigs got loose, and we fed them whiskey so they'd fall over and we could get them back in the barn. How them pigs got loose in the first place, we'll never know, but we fed them more than a few bottles till they dropped over sideways. Then Uncle Reggie started up the front end loader and shoveled up them pigs. It was a shame one of them fell off, way up on high it fell off of, plop into that extra muddy spot down by the pond. Caused a real stir it did. But Uncle Reggie's a real ace on that loader. He lifted that porker right up again, lickety split. It's squealing all the while, squealing, squealing squealing so loud as it rode that bucket up high all the way back to the barn and heard that barn door slam tight shut behind. As you probably already know, December 10th is 
Emily Dickinson's birthday. So we'll do a few of Emily Dickinson. Um, let's see. It's the one. Let's see. Um, It's the one that I think, uh, when I read it, or say, say it, that um, it makes me think that she's writing about poetry. Now I found it. I have only 65 in here, so I have to look to see the 65 titles. Um, I step from plank to plank, a sure and cautious way. The stars above my head I felt, about my feet the sea. I know not what the next might be my final inch. This gave me that precarious gait some call experience. <laughs> okay. And then I have two that, um, yeah, let's do this one. With pinions of disdain. With pinions of disdain, the soul can farther, fl farther fly than any feather specified in ornithology. It wafts this sordid flesh beyond this dull control, and during its electric gale, the body is a soul. Instructing by the same, what little work it be to put off filaments like this for immortality. I died for beauty. I died for beauty, but was scarcely, let's see. I died for beauty, but was scarcely adjusted in the tomb, when one who died for truth was laying in the adjoining room. He questioned softly why I failed. For beauty, I reply. And, and I for truth, he said. We brethren, uh, let's see. Yeah, we brethren, let's see. Let me start over here. I died for beauty, but was scarce adjusted in the tomb when one who died for truth was laying in an adjoining room. I questioned softly why he failed. For beauty, uh, he replied. No, he questioned softly why I failed. For beauty, he replied. And I for truth, themself for one. We brethren are, he said. And so as kinsmen met a night, we talked between the rooms until the moss had reached our lips and covered up our names. I'll do one more, okay? Sure, real short. Hope, yes sir. Good for this. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard, but sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the, oh boy. I mean, I've known this for about three years, three or four years, this see. We're, we're waiting to hear it, so take your time. What's that? It's, we're waiting to hear the bird. Yeah. Um, hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words, and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard, but sore must be the storm that could have asked the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, but never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, sure, I'll read another poem. Um, 
This one is called, this is also from my, uh, from my new, new book, Rainbow Weather. This is called Cloud Castles. After all this blood, here we are still torn in this crisis of destruction and delusion. At a time like this, how can we even think of celebration? Remember that hazy summer day, we lay side by side in the grass, gazing lazily into the clouds. Tell me, what do you see? A dolphin jumping through a wave, a swaying palm tree, a field of corn, a rhinoceros horn, wind and rain, the shapes change, a swooping bumblebee, a raging storm at sea, a crimson bird soaring along the horizon, a frowning clown, an angry crowd, an angry clown, a frowning clown, an angry crowd, a thundering herd of bison. Look up into the sky, into the clouds. Tell me, what do you see? Grim masks in crowded dungeons, prisoners whispering forbidden thoughts forever unfinished, midwives hugging bleeding infants, orphans holding endless wakes, widow seizing desperate moments, windows shattering lost childhoods, concrete collapsing bridges and dams, toxic water gushing through neighborhoods, broken priests torturing war dogs, just everyday terror and plunder, boys murdering men, murdering women, forests blazing, animals fleeing, all the great grandchildren scream, the gangster banker regime, the loathsome empire's last bitter crimes, drip, drip, dripping, dark splatters of blood on the last rotting dreams, clotting in the last gutter. None of this will ever be forgotten. Yet it is written, invincible regimes collapse. All powerful empires swept away to nowhere. New civilizations arise from the earth with a kiss. The clouds change. The moment of celebration is to be. Remember that hazy summer day we lay lazily in the grass, gazing up into the sky. Tell me, what do you see? Lovers in a filthy jail, the rings on a tiger's tail, salmon creeks, flamingo beaks, gazing gazelles, Buddha bells, flowering Joshua trees, sunrise over turquoise seas. On a much uh, simpler note, in the smaller world of our own micro economics versus the macro, this is a little old favorite of mine that I've just called fairy tale. Many of you have heard it before. Once upon a time, long, long ago, when I was very, very young, I thought I'd grow up, be a great big hero, knight in shining armor, conquering the world of my dreams. But something happened along the way. I got lost in the endless day to day until they checked my expiration date. How much shelf life I had left. How the hell did I get this old? 
without even knowing it. It was certainly something I intended to postpone till way, way later. Oops. And then when I go to another sound, one, one kind of, I guess, my, my favorite old ones that I really enjoy reading for probably the most immature of reasons, which would be pretty evident. I lovingly call this anger management therapy. That's what poetry is. Really? Yeah. So I woke up one morning in a real bad mood. My therapist told me to keep a journal. Write it all down, Bobby boy. Bring it in next time. Let's talk about it. So I did what he told me, and this is what I said. After more than 80 friggin' years now of playing make-believe and getting real, real tired of playing nice. Spent this long, long overextended childhood trying to please everyone, make sure everyone in the group liked me. Like so many well-bred, well-behaved boys and girls, all paved by the well-meaning intentions of good old mommy and daddy. Despite digging the primitive truth, little boys just want to be tough and scary, little girls just want to be nice and pretty. So I've had it now, no more playing games, no more holier-than-thou endless poetic charades. The next fool who tries to unscrew me cap better tread very carefully, because this old, old can of worms has a lifetime build-up of contents under pressure, backed up and ready to blow. So why don't you give me just one more little whack, old buddy, and let the fun begin? After which the therapist said, Sorry, old Bob, your hour's up. <laughs> Maybe next time. Go in peace. What's a poor boy to do? Thanks for listening. I, I have really come to realize uh, what a gift when we are hallowing and celebrating with poetry, with the poems of others that we take into ourselves. And one of the most recent poets I've come to cherish like a reflection of the Holy Spirit is uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins. And I want to recite uh, the poem that ultimately led me to uh, echoing response. So the first poem is, as kingfishers catch fire, the dragonflies draw flame. As tumbled over rims and roundy wells, stones fling. Like each tucked string tells, each hung bell's bow swung finds tongue to fling out broad its name. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same. Deals out that being, indoors each one dwells. Selves it goes, myself it speaks and spells, crying, what I do I am, for that I came. I say more, the just man justices, keeps grace that keeps all his goings graces. Acts in God's eye. Shush. <laughs> I have to compose myself. 
acts in God's eye, but in God's eye, thank you, but in God's eye, he is Christ, for Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs, lovely in eyes, not his, to the features of men's faces. So if I get carried away, it's because I thought it was a reflection of the Holy Spirit. And here then is the gift of the Holy Spirit through me in response to um, the life uh, he gave his life for, as we do to a great extent, as we are live the lives of poets in a seemingly world devoid of uh, meaning or place for poets and poetry. Uh, so it goes, and I'm, oh, so I, I should say it began during COVID, this poem, I, I was experiencing COVID and I was, the line was coming to me, I wake and feel the fell of dark. <laughs> and I knew it was a Gerard Manley Hopkins poem, but I, I wasn't quite sure that's the way it went. And uh, it actually goes, uh, I wake and feel the fell of dark, not day. Oh, and I was saying, I wake and feel the, well, anyways, here's my poem, pardon me. Um, <clears throat> All right. You wake and feel the fell of day, not dark, for Christ's light is your light, and fell your flame, and fell for we who think so highly of ourselves, our bodies engendering our staffs, expanding, blossoming, threatening our shells. That light, why does it illumine me from within? I wear the common cloak of man, walk along our dark streets as once you did, or do you still? How in such wandering, then, has your presence been so close to mine? <clears throat> As kingfishers catch fire, poets fall dumb waiting, watching the flight magnificent of their parents, oh, bright wings, descent in spirals and quarrels and now fluttering thoughts. Thank you. Another one of mine from the Mountain Troubadour. This one's dedicated to my great-grandfather. Lazarus and Six Horses from a sepia photograph, circa 1891. The horse's ears are perked and alert. They seem to watch the photographer. Even in sepia tone, we can see their different shades of brown and gray, hitched together and used to pulling as a team to thresh winter wheat. My great-grandfather Lazarus Paget stands to the left of his horses barely holding the reins as his horses pose, overalls, hand in hand, probably the year my grandmother was born. In the only other photo, his horses are hitched to threshers. Wheat and horses now on what had been Kiowa, Ottawa, Ojibwa, and Potawatomi land for a millennium and more, all forced onto reservations. I can't know what Lazarus thought of this. Some of his family were probably part Kiowa. Or what he'd think of Kingman now, just a few large farms where there were dozens, wheat from his fields shipped across the globe. Summer day is almost always 100 degrees, a four-lane highway to Wichita. His great-grandchildren scattered across Kansas and all over the country. 
None of us farms, and only one has horses. Three generations apart, our lifetimes overlapped briefly, but we grew up in different worlds. I look at Lazarus and his six horses and wish I could ask him their names. Uh, just uh, another poem, winter poem, and another little, little haiku after. The first, first one is called Hoarfrost. Crystalline fronds of hoar etch the pain, refractoring the mornings, first stray rays that venture in, in, into this bank of dark space. The day dawns, the, the sun, the sun the, 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 sorry. The day dawns like love, rays fructify, and the warmth, the warmth of this sun smile pierces the winter's crust, the wintry crust. Irradiating it, uh, consuming its cancer, and bestowing the glow of life once again. On a dark and dead room, my soul. Mm. Sorry about this. Really, I just have trouble seeing up here. Yeah, that's okay. Um. See, this one's called Iris, and Iris is the name of a dear old friend, quite a bit older than me, and I learned that she had died not too long back. Iris. Time was when upon a death, all useful things were gladly taken, threads, needles, pans, spoons. What was in places worn might make a patch. A chipped dish might in another kitchen house a plant, some parsley or fragrant rosemary. From drawers, the clan would sort the photographs, chat over memories and tea. Granddaughters would leave with small collections. A seasoned spoon in a new kitchen would stir the batter from an old recipe. Irish gone, her shadow lies lifeless in the cold bungalow. No clan here. Now the agent ousts the few antiques of value, naming them in pounds sterling. His two lads drag what's left out the door and heap it on the lawn. Coats, gloves, dishes, books. Photo albums splay open on the wet grass and the rain comes down. And the other one is um, about my granddaughter, um, high school granddaughter, who uh, keeps well in touch with me. And she likes to take part in rowing, rowing longboats. Granddaughter. She texted me this morning said they'd come in second, the pride somehow shining from the short words on my screen. 15 now, and rowing is her passion. A team of eight in a boat, straining, pulling hardest, striving for the prize. And the water sprays wide in the hot New York sun, mysteriously warm in April and their rosy faces glisten sweet with sweat. One comments how the water is already low. One dares another for a dip. I scan the years before her. How early will the ice be out when she is 25? How many mighty storms will she withstand? A refugee crouched on a mountain top? All possessions lost on the drowned streets she fled? 
How many farmers can feed her no bread? Where will be a shack that might still offer her shelter? This is a little poem that I'll recite it twice and you'll have all learned it by the time I've said it twice. It's called Ars Pacifica by Craig Santos Perez, who is the poet laureate of Guam. When the tide of silence rises, say, ocean, then with the paddle of your tongue, rearrange the letters to form canoe. Ready? One more time, and you'll have all learned a new poem. How many have heard the poem before? Have you heard it? Take me twice, Gary and Lloyd. I have it all memorized. All stages. When the tide of silence rises, when the tide, say, of, silence when rises, the tide of silence rises, say, say ocean. 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 Then, with the paddle of your tongue, then with the paddle of your tongue, tongue rearrange the letters, rearrange the letters to form, to form canoe. 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 canoe, 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 Whoa! Hmm. 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 <laughs> wait, this, this wait, who more. are we swallowing? Huh. What's that? Which poet are we swallowing here? That's Craig Santos Perez. Okay, and he's the poet laureate of Guam? Guam. And he's alive? He is. I think he's, he may be presently teaching either in Hawaii or in California. All right. Okay. He's probably like, you know, young. It, it must be a little bit of a climate change comment, this poem. Is that, am I correct? Climate change? Yeah. No, it's the it's the beauty of words. You take a word. That's a climate change poem. If that was a love one. Yeah. Which is you that take it? a word and you look at it, and can you make another word out of it? Come on, there's tons of words you can make out of it. <laughs> Have you tried it? I tried it. It's very difficult. Depends how many letters you get. Right. Uh, yeah. 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 But the ocean rise, you need a canoe. Yes. That's what it's about. Yes. Canoe. Okay. Um, let's do a little Stevie Smith. Oh, Not waving, but drowning. I was much further out than you thought. No, that's not a way to begin. I think uh, you were. <laughs> No one heard him, the dead man, but still he lay moaning. I was much further out than you thought, and not waving, but drowning. Poor chap, he always loved laughing, and now he's dead. It must have been too cold for him. His heart gave way, they said. Oh, no, 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 it was too cold always. Still, the dead one lay moaning. I was much too far out all my life, and not waving, but drowning. <laughs> yes, I'll do one more poem for you. I said, great to meet all of you. You know, so very, very good stuff going on in Vermont, I see. Um, so uh, this, this poem is called, um, uh, She Said, he said, don't worry about trying to fix it. He said, we've destroyed this world past redemption, beyond habitability. It's dead, murdered. Our task now is to leave and colonize another planet. Wow, he really said that, seriously. He imagines heroically saving humanity from extinction by escaping 
to some spacesuit utopia in the stars. That is the Puritan's eye, escaping the corrupt old world, reinventing yourself in a new city on a hill in an imagined tabula rasa, the eye of the imperialist, dreaming that there is always some new pristine place to start over again and plunder. Even now, when people have pillaged the entire earth and there is no place left here to plunder. Then go if you must, she said, to your own suicide, but don't expect me to buy you that spaceship. Even if life really did come here long ago from the stars, she said, and even if that means we are star people too. Even so, we have been here so long, we are now and forever earth people. And this earth does not belong to us. We belong to her. This planet is not an object we can use, abuse, discard like so much garbage. Our task is now not to escape, but to stay right here, to hold fast to earth, to learn how to live here, to protect her. We are now and forever inseparable from her, our wild watery habitat, our precious green mother. So once again, if you don't mind, we'll go from uh, the insufferable large issues that we've just heard to a very uh, smaller microcosm. Those of you who are in our group have heard these before, but I'd like to share them with uh, our folks who have them. I was thinking of reading another one that was a Christmas theme, maybe, but it's, it's so sad, uh, I can't do it. Uh, I'm referring to it, though, because you are poets, and then maybe if some of you know it, or if you don't, please look up a poem called The Death of Santa Claus by Charles Parker Webb. It is one of the saddest, most beautiful poems I've ever read. Seriously. So, on a lighter note, the old fool waxes poetic. Uh, can imagine who that is. So I did a lot of Shakespeare as a young actor and a kid. I didn't know what I was talking about, but sure thought I did. Now I'm older than dirt, I get it. How much of what Willie said really fits. So for all you other old souls out there with a little help from the shakes, here's a little tidbit. I think it's time to stop fooling around. The franchise of youth is over. Our revels now are ended. Endless time has ended. Now the real end game begins. What to do? If I only knew, welcome to the club. Living in the moment, as they say, and all the rest. Rationalization at its very best. Meditation to the max, as good as it gets. However you play it, curtain still drops after third act. We are such stuff as dreams are made on and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Finally, similar vein, lament of the lazy poet. Again, you can guess who that is. So how do I find the words to speak the unspeakable? Attach to things that be beyond all words, sounds that break the bounds of all self-consciousness, breathing fresh air into the vacuum of our closed little lives, trying to touch impossibly 
those wondrous, mysterious mountains of love, being, life itself. It is much too much for most mortal souls, much less an old fool like me who can barely scratch out a few more paltry lines of the same old puerile poetry. Nevertheless, namaste, they say, blessed be, hope springs eternal or even old dogs like me. Thanks for this. This is, just comes to mind, and again, it's we're sort of poetry, celebrating poetry, which is fine. I mean, painters celebrate painters, and you know, we have to celebrate ourselves. So uh, this is in honor of both Dennis McCullough and uh, his wife, Oh my gosh, and his wife, whose name, Pam. Anyway, um, she had a poem, poetry published. Harrison. Harrison, yes, right. And, uh, and she has her own very distinctive style and she brings a ton of emotion and a ton of relationships to all her poetry. And I thought to myself, since I haven't decided to go the publishing route, uh, other than self-publishing, uh, I thought to myself, well, if you're published, does it really matter? I mean, isn't the big question, how much can a poet say in a word? And I thought to myself, well, that's a good question. If that's 10 syllables, I was on my way to church, believe it or not. I had to get that in, Bob. Why not? <laughs> uh, on my way to church, and I said, if that's 10 syllables, I'm going to write a poem on that when I get back. And uh, it was... How much can a poet say in a word? And I like using the form of ten syllables. How much can a poet say in a word? A word like a love drawing him within. Past commonplaces into a chamber in which she unlaces all nuances and lets them slip in her magnificence. So you may adore each curving line and marvel silent and adore. <laughs> How much can a poet say in a word? I apologize. I, uh, I put in adore and cherish only a poem that memorizes no that <laughs> screwed up her. I should have, I should really have um, practiced this before I deliver it. I'll remember that in the future, but I'll finish it now. Uh, how long should a line of poetry be, given birth from the cloud of unknowing? Oh, let the spirit dance and spread her arms, arms catching our eyes, our ears, all senses, as we whirl in rhythm and rhyme and sight. Here, let us dance. We have danced all alone holding the flowers fallen from the night. Well, thank you for having me and for honoring Poetry Society of Vermont. I put two freebies in our journal up there. If you're interested in joining, you leave your email in the list. This is one from our journal from, by Gazi Tetralia. Stardust from heaven. Lighting my way home, fireflies float among the trees, stardust from heaven. This one's dedicated to my late friend and poetry society member, George Mathon. More than mere absence. George, there's only one of us here today. Another summer poetry workshop, cicadas, honeysuckle, day lilies, lines we try to write. There used to be two Georges, both poets at these gatherings. Which one were you? Now we know the difference because one of us is dead and death is more than mere absence. 
You left behind your poems and habits that day you died. You used paper twice, printing your final drafts on the back of first drafts. At the house in Florida, you'd complain if I left the milk out for two minutes. You could take seashells, heron feathers, and marsh grass, weave them together word by word, and spill them into water. Driving to our Vermont summer workshops, you watched, you watched birds, which I knew would fly into your poems. You brought lunch in a cooler, nor no warm milk or sandwich for you. Today I got here earlier than you would have liked. Sometimes you were so tired. It doesn't matter so much now that there's only one of us. It was more than all those lines we wrote together, birds and misplaced modifiers, milk left out on the counter. So much more than sharing the same name, George. You know, I still write with the same pen I did then. Mm. Thank you. So I just want to thank uh, all the great poets who have contributed tonight and uh, contribute generally to Three Sight. And I want to especially thank Liza for organizing tonight's event and for organizing all the recites throughout the year. It's that fabulous support uh, for the poets in our community here. So thank you. And I also want to thank the Poetry Society of Vermont for their tremendous support of poetry in the state. And I, I know I've benefited from uh, being a member, and uh, George and I have become uh, true friends in the process. And so I urge all of you to join the society if you, if you can. And uh, you'll get the same support I did. So thank you, and thank you again, everybody, for coming.